Amen. Have you ever felt like you don't you don't feel like you're going to have a victory? Have you ever been in a place where you're just like weak in the knees? Um, uh, you know, my my experience of that was was because of a guy named Kevin, and Kevin was one of those guys who I'm a fourth grader, he's a sixth grader, but he looks like a tenth grader, and and he had made me a promise, and that was that he was going to 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 beat my tail in so many words um, when we got home. And, and I remember the long walk from the elementary school um, down the sidewalk along 4th Avenue in Conway. Um, and it's, it's strange. We, we walked side by side with his plan to beat me when we got to my house. And, um, and, and so, so, so literally, I mean, I felt almost like my knees were shaking. Um, I had been made real clear. It was made real clear to me by him that um that you know my nickname was skinny mini i mean i had no defense um i was i was i was in trouble and if you've ever been in that place and you've ever felt that sense of of helplessness of being bullied um like how many of you in the room right now where you are and how many people here have ever been bullied you know what i'm saying i mean somebody somebody talking either like physically bullying you or emotionally bullying you be, being bullied is a tough place to be but what I experienced as a fourth grader is nowhere in comparison to the bullying that actually comes from our enemy, from Satan himself. Um, when we're told in in First Peter, as you read this week in chapter 5, uh, verse 8, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Um, because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. The truth is the enemy is after every one of us, but I want to tell you that, that we, we, we think of that like you usually think of, of like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour like he's going to try to devour me physically. But, but in reality, it, it is spiritually and emotionally and, and within your spirit that, that you're devoured. And the number one, uh, the number one tactic of the enemy uh, is discouragement. And what's so powerful about our reading plan is you're reading through the Bible. I'm so proud of you for doing that. If you aren't, don't worry about it. Just start today. Just jump in. Um, go on to, to ChristIsLove.org. Click the daily reading and start with where we are now. But as you've been reading it, those of you who have already been reading, you know that we heard a story about kind of like the the penultimate bully named Shennacherib. And Shennacherib was this, this bully who was the king of Assyria, real person, king of Assyria. There was a king um, over Judah. His name was Hezekiah, who was a super righteous man. But Shennacherib was the, the ultimate bully. And the, the source behind bullying throughout, um, throughout Scripture and throughout life, the source behind all bullying ultimately is Satan himself. He, he just desires to, to, to bring you down. And if he can put it in somebody else's heart to bring you down, he will. And discouragement being his number one weapon, I, I just want to kind of ask you guys, and I want to ask everybody um, uh, in your homes as you're listening here, um, how have you been um, attacked with these temptations to this, this attack of discouragement in your life? Well, let me tell you how it happened with Sennacherib. Um, uh, when, when Sennacherib actually, I think is how you pronounce his name, but Sennacherib actually sent his, his little minions. Later, um, God called them his underlings. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19 is where we'll be today. You can also read about this. It's such a powerful story that it's not only told in 2 Kings 18 and 19, it's also told in 2 Chronicles 32 and also in the book of Isaiah chapter 36. So three different times this story comes up, and it's like um, when, when God's done something three times, you think it's probably pretty important um, that he brings that story forward. And what uh, Sennacherib had done is he sent these, these three... Um, little underlings um, to to do his bidding. Now, now they were um, his chief, uh, actually his supreme um, officer. I mean, his supreme uh, commander, his chief officer, and his field officer. But the field officer, if you read certain translations, um, the name for for field officer that that's translated field officer in some translations is actually. Um, it's called, uh, help me with that word, Camden. Um, come on. Idiot. Thank you. 
Way to go. It's Rabshakeh. And so my grandson Camden, whoo, way to go, buddy. So, um, so Rabshakeh was the, the, the name, and, and actually it was, it was actually used as a name, like people had called him Rabshakeh in many translations of the Bible. Um, and it can be either the name Rabshakeh, or it can be that he was the chief representative, the chief spokesperson for him. Now, I want to know who your Rab Shakeh is. Your Rab Shakeh, that chief spokesperson for the enemy, that the, that the enemy uses to speak to you, to bring you discouragement, to bring you down. There, there are those. Now, that he wasn't the only one. There are others there. But Rab Shakeh was the chief one. He was the chief spokesperson for Shennacherib to bring these words of discouragement to Hezekiah. Now, for you, again, I just want you to know that the enemy probably has a chief, chief spokesperson in your life. It might have been that you grew up with somebody with a, a parent who, who did that to you, and, and your parent was the one who was the chief spokesperson for the enemy speaking into your life that you were nothing. It might be somebody that, that you're in a close relationship with, like a marriage. It might have been a teacher. It might have been a bully in school, but it might be your very own voice. The most tragic thing is when be you become um, your own rabshakeh, when, when you become your own uh, worst enemy, you become that underling that the enemy uses your own voice to speak words of discouragement to you. But, but, but let me just, let's look at some of the ways that he brought that discouragement. Again, we're in 2 Kings chapter 18, and as he's bringing this discouragement, when you get to verses 20 and 21, his first discouragement was this. He says, on what are you basing this confidence, right? I'm going to try to take away confidence from you. I'm going to try to discourage you. I'm going to try to make you feel helpless. Are you doing it because you're trusting in the, the, the Pharaoh um, of Egypt? And he says, look, he's like a splintered reed that pierces the hand of anybody who leans on him. He ain't going to be there for you. Now, now what's interesting is, is that that's probably true <laughs> of the king of Egypt. The, the reality is, is that, is that um, Hezekiah would know not to even put his trust in anyone but the Lord God above. But that attack of the enemy is so common, and basically it's this. Have you ever heard this thought? Nobody likes you, and nobody cares. Nobody likes you, and nobody cares. Like, this, this person isn't really going to stick up for you. They really aren't going to be there for you. And the enemy works on causing us to doubt those in our lives that would have otherwise been there for us or with us. And so his first attack was to say, hey, whoever you're trusting in, I'm going to tell you, you can't trust them. And you can't trust them to care about you. So have you ever felt that level of discouragement? When he gets to verse 21, he then goes on and says, and are you trusting in what Hezekiah is saying? Because what Hezekiah is calling on the Lord, and he's using the name Yahweh, Lord, it's all, oh, it's a profound and holy name. He says, he says Don't, isn't this the same God that, that Hezekiah removed the high places from throughout Judea and said you have to worship in Jerusalem? Now here's what's interesting. is Hezekiah had done something very good. The high places needed to be removed because they were places that you could use to worship Yahweh, but they also became very profaned and very messed up. And so he had done a very good thing. But what um, Shennacherib's underling, uh, Rabshakeh, is saying is, is, look, Hezekiah has messed up everything, including the relationship that you have with God. He has, he has botched it up. Have you, ever, have you ever been attacked on this level, and your attack and the discouragement you have is, is, is I have messed everything up, even with God. Like my decisions, I tried to do what was right, I tried to do the right thing, and as much as I tried to do the right thing and I felt like it was the right decisions and I do that, I feel like I've messed everything up. For everybody, even with God, I've messed things up. If you ever feel that discouragement, just understand it's old. It's been around a long, long time. So if you ever felt like, hey, nobody likes me and nobody cares, have you ever felt like, hey, man, I've messed up everything, including um, the, the relationship with God, and, and, and I've messed that up for me and all those around me. Then the third discouragement that he brings is when he says he starts mocking, basically, um, the armies of Hezekiah and the armies of the living God. And he says, look, if you want me to, I can give you 2,000 horses, but y'all couldn't even put riders on the 2,000 horses. And he says, I'll give you the horses, and if you can put riders on them, 
your 2,000 couldn't take on one of our commanders. And what he's saying is, is you're a wimp. You, you're, you and, and your nation and your people, you are weak, you are pitiful, and you are laughable. I'm like making fun of you. And it's like it is on the playground, just like you're weak and you're pitiful and you're laughable. Have you ever been in that place, any of you there, any of us here, have you ever been in that place where just the ridicule against you is, is you're stupid, you're weak, you're, 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 not, you're not good, and, and you're not, you don't have the strength to do anything, you don't have the ability to do anything, and you're laughable, you're a joke. And, and most of us will get that at some time um, in our lives in, in the way of discouragement. Um, the next thing he says is just huge, and this one hits so many people in discouragement. It's in verse 25 when he says, and by the way, <laughs> do you think that I've come to do this without the Lord? And he uses the name of the Lord, Yahweh. So, so this Rabshakeh is actually saying the Lord, Yahweh, sent us to do this to you. He sent my master to do this to you. Now, now I, I just want to tune in, and, and y'all, y'all know this. The enemy will make you believe that God himself wants to take you down. When you're going through what you're going through, and it's maybe relationships falling apart, it may be financial stuff, it may be whatever, but the enemy will make you think that God himself wants to take you down. And so if you've ever been in that place of discouragement where you see bad things happening, whether it's in your physical health or whether it's in your, or, or your finances or your relationships or whatever the case may be, you will be tempted to believe that God himself wants to take you down. Well, you think that's enough when it comes to discouragement, but then he takes it up a notch because the, there were three of the officials of Hezekiah who had been sent out, and actually all this was being said by Rabshakeh and the other two officials from Shennacherib were being said to these three officials. Um, and these three officials said to Rabshakeh, they said, would you do us a favor? Would you speak to us? in Aramaic, because we understand Aramaic. Don't speak to us in Hebrew because the people on the wall can hear what you're saying. And what Rabshakeh said was, what? You want me to just speak to you? No way. Do you think that I've come only to say this to the king? I've come to say this to you and everybody else who are going to have to be eating your own excrement and drinking your own urine because I'm, we're going to besiege this city and you're not going to be able to get out of it. So then he begins to speak words of discouragement to everyone on the wall in Hebrew. And so this chief spokesperson is now speaking to everyone on the wall saying, you can't trust Hezekiah, you can't trust Hezekiah's God, you can't trust what's going on, and you're going to be destroyed, and you need to understand that you better submit now to us or you're going to be in trouble. Now, here's the, the, the next point then is this, is that, is that when you're under that place where the enemy's trying to discourage you, he will also reach into the people you love and try to bring distrust and discouragement among the people you love. Like, nobody can trust you. Nobody should trust you. And you'll begin to feel like, like, nobody should trust me. Like, like these people begin to have doubts about you, and doubts about your character, and doubts about what you're doing. And if you ever have that happen in, among people you love, it's an old, old, old tactic, and it's been around a long time. Well, he goes on, and, and uh, as he, he moves on in his discouraging words, he then says to all the people, but if you all come to our side, if you will trust in us, then you're going to drink from your own cisterns, you're going to eat grapes from your own vines, everything's going to be good, you'll have olive trees and, and honey, and, and I'm going to bring you into a great land, and everything's going to be good if you'll trust in me. Um, I, I promise you that you will be here at some point, if the enemy is after you, you'll be in a place where you will be made to believe everybody would really be better off without me. It, without me and without my leadership, without what I'm doing, everybody would really be better off without me. And the enemy is trying to tell everybody they'd be all right and they'd be better off without you as well. And so all that attacking and all that stuff going on, he finishes out that chapter um, Shennacherib um, is sending the message to Hezekiah saying, do you think that out of all the people that we've destroyed, the Assyrians had destroyed nation after nation um, and taken them into captivity, do you think that your God can save you? No other God has been able to save, um, and, and your God is not going to be able to save you, so you might as well give it in. Now, 
Now, having faced discouragement, if you've been a person who's ever been discouraged, or maybe you're discouraged now, and maybe you're discouraged because of what's happening in the COVID environment, what's happening in our nation, what's happening around you, but personal discouragement comes to say to you, nobody really likes you, nobody really cares about what's going on in your life. The, the, the discouragement of the enemy wants to say to you personally, you've messed everything up. And, and what you've done has messed up everything, including your relationship with God. The enemy wants to say to you, you're weak, you're pitiful, you're nothing, and you're laughable. The enemy wants to say to you, even God wants to take you down. The, the enemy wants to say to you that, that nobody should trust you, and he wants to say it into the people in your life, to saying you just shouldn't trust Trust them. So, so if all those things have been said to you, and then you ultimately get to that place where the enemy wants you to make, make you feel that people would be better off without you, that, 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 and people, mamas will feel like that with their children, and, and husbands feel like that with their wives, and, and people just get to the place where they're in that discouragement. The enemy's attack is severe. So how do you handle it? The response to how to handle it is so contrary to what you would think. Because you think that when somebody's trying to push you down, that the way that you get out of that is by, like, bowing up. But what happens with Hezekiah in chapter 19, verse 1, is just the opposite of bowing up. It's actually him humbling himself. He tears his clothes and puts on sackcloth. He goes before the Lord in humility. And let me tell you the why. It's because what Hezekiah was not saying was, you say I'm not all that, but I am all that. I am great. I do have power. I can do whatever I want to do. Instead, his position was, no, you don't understand. If you attack me, I trust in God. And when you attack me and I'm trusting in God, then where I'm going is to God. I'm going to humility before God, and I'm going to let God deal with you. So humility before God and even humility before others put you in a position of power. So right before that verse 8 in First uh, Peter chapter 5, he says this in verse 5, the latter part of verse 5. Now he's talking about our relationships with each other within the body of Christ. But then he says this, he says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So, so that humility of humbling ourselves before him allows him to lift us up in due time. And so, so Hezekiah's response was a response of humility. And what I want to ask you is when you're in that place of being bullied by the enemy and you're being, you're being attacked with those discouragements and those things that are coming your way and all kinds of things are being said to you, maybe even by your own voice, you come to a place of humility and you come before the Lord and you say to him, God, um, if I'm being attacked right now, I trust in you. So that means they're talking trash about you. And that's exactly what was happening with Shennacherib because Hezekiah completely trusted in God. And if you're talking trash about me, you're talking trash about God. Yeah. And if you're saying that, that God isn't going to help me, then you're going to have to deal with God. Well, this, this experience you see that that Hezekiah does it in chapter 19, verses 2 and 3, that even his representatives that he sends to go um, to Isaiah, it's really cool. And, and that's the reason Isaiah records it as well. Isaiah was a prophet, and so he sent his three representatives to go to Isaiah, and even them he had put on sackcloth. They're going in humility, and they're going to Isaiah. And what they do is this. So first in humility, he spread it out before the Lord. He laid it before him. He cast it onto the Lord this is where I am. He said, this is a horrible day. This is a day of rebuke and, and distress and disgrace. It's a terrible day. It's like a day when a child's coming to be born and there's not enough energy to bring the child to birth. It's a bad day. I mean, and so he's being honest with God about where things are. I'm discouraged right now. I've got a real tough time right now, but I'm coming before you, God. And so when he says in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 5, then verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, Hezekiah was doing that. It's like, I'm just going to give it to you, God. And I'm going to say, this is where I really am, and this is what I'm really feeling, and, and I'm going to put it on you because you care for me. And when he did that, um, after having done that, Shennacherib himself starts attacking Hezekiah, and he sends him letters 
telling him kind of the same thing. And so what Hezekiah does is he brings the letters and he actually lays out he lays out what Sennacherib had read, um, had written to him before the Lord. And he says, God, do you see what he's saying? Do you see what he's saying? God, you, you're going to have to deal with him because he's not only talking trash about me, he's talking trash about you, Father. And so he lays it out before the Lord and he cast it before the Lord. Now, having cast it before the Lord, I just want to say to everybody here, I want to say to everybody in the home, that when you start getting discouraged, your first step is down here. Can y'all still see me if I go down here? <laughs> y'all good? All right. So, um, so it's down here in humility, and it's down here laying it out before him, and it's casting all that anxiety and all that fear and all that worry and all that mess and all that discouragement, and it's casting that before him and saying, God, now, now you, need, you need to deal with it because if I humble myself before him, then he has the opportunity to lift me up. And let me tell you how he lifts you up. And this is so important. Is we got the whole thing was about what's being said to you by your Rabshakeh. You know, your Rabshakeh is saying all this stuff to you. The enemy is using someone, maybe even your own voice, to say all these things to you that aren't true, that make you feel discouragement and doubt and question. But then when you humble yourself before the Lord, then you tune in to say, I don't need to hear any longer what I would say to myself or my Rabshakeh would say to me, I need to hear what you say to me, what you say about me. And so in chapter 19, verse 6, a good example of that is when Isaiah says, he says to those three representatives that were sent to Isaiah, he says, you go back and tell your master, tell Hezekiah this. This is what the Lord says, right? Don't, don't you be afraid because, and, and I love the word, don't be afraid because of what you've heard, because of these words that these underlings of the king of Assyria have used to blaspheme me. He said, don't you listen to them. Don't you worry about them. Don't you be afraid of what they're saying about these words. Let me tell you what's true and what I'm going to do for you and what I'm going to do to them if they don't repent in the process. And so listening to what God says about you, listening to what God says to you is the key to your being lifted up out of that. Now, it's not self-talk. It's not like I'm going to tell myself that I'm good. I'm not going to tell myself that it's going to be okay. When God tells you that it's going to be okay, when you hear God say, don't be afraid, there's a whole new level of power in that because it's him saying it. It's God saying it to you. So you begin to listen to what God says. And guys, over and over and over in Scripture, God has loaded Scripture with the words like that that you need to hear. Deuteronomy 31 uh, verse 6 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 41.10 that we just recently read says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Over and over and over again, God gives those words of encouragement. And he's saying, I want you to hear what I'm saying is true for you. And I'm saying is true about you. So listen to what God says to you. But then listen, this is so important. Then listen to what God says to them. The, re the reality of, of what we do when we get caught up, if you answer a fool according to his folly, you become like the fool yourself. Right? And so that's on the human level. And when you're dealing with the enemy's attacks and where the devil himself wants to bring you down, there's that tendency for Christians to think, well, what I do is I engage in this conversation with the devil. It was cool that Hezekiah had told his, his representatives, he said, don't you even answer this underling. Don't even answer him. Just go out, listen to him, come back and tell me. You don't even engage that. And so many Christians have been taught this piece that it's almost like our thing is to bow up to the devil and say, I'm going to stomp the devil. And you know what I'm saying? There's that attitude we read in the book of 1 Peter in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, that that is actually a sign of arrogance and foolishness. He said that, that not even angels who are far more powerful than we will slander celestial beings when they're calling on the Lord to rebuke them. And when Jude speaks of the same thing, he says that not even the archangel Michael rebuked the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke you. 
And so what it is, is we don't need, it's not you and me. It's not me bowing up to Kevin and saying like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> My little old skinny, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like, no, it's not, it's not me bowing up to Kevin and saying, I'm going to take you out. It's saying, I got a God, right? I've got a God who's like way bigger than you. And, and what God says to you, is what matters. So listen to what God says to his enemy as you go through and read. And I want you to read in verse 20 um, in chapter uh, 19, starting in verse 20 and read the following because it's so beautiful. One of the things he says in the midst of it is he says, I've heard your insolence. It's reached my ears. And he says to Shennacherib, he says, I'm going to put a hook in your nose. I'm going to put a bit in your mouth. I'm going to send you back the way that you came. And God said, I'm going to deal with you, right? I'm going to deal with you. Guys, what Hezekiah did is Hezekiah didn't write back his cocky letter in response. Hezekiah didn't bow up to talk about what he was going to do to Shennacherib. Hezekiah went to Isaiah and said, Isaiah, tell me what the Lord says. And what the Lord says happens. And what the Lord says is done. And so you Listen to what the Lord says about your enemies. Listen to what the Lord says. And you can read over and over and over again. Even in Psalm 73, when, when the writer of that Asaph is talking about seeing how his enemies are prospering and people who are doing evil or good things are happening to them, bad things aren't happening. He says, until I entered the sanctuary and I saw what was ultimately going to happen to them. And I realized what God was going to do if they didn't repent of their sin. And guys, you go through all the way to the book of Revelation and you have the answer of what's going to happen to those who are in rebellion against God. And God's just saying, you remember what I've said will happen to them. Well, what happened to Sennacherib was that 185,000 of his soldiers, God wiped them out in an instant. Sennacherib went back to Assyria, and when he got back to Assyria, he was worshiping one of his gods in a temple, and two of his sons came and killed him. And it was done. Now, now he, here's, the, here's, the, here's the point, is that if you got somebody bullying you in your life, um, you pray to God and God's going to take them out. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> no. The, the reality is, is that when you listen to what God says about those in your life, your, your rabshakes, those people who are influencing you, discouraging you, hurting you, um, what God says through the gospel, and this is what the book of First Peter is actually focused so much on, is that I'm actually going to, through you, influence even the bullies in your life. I'm going to use you, and there's going to be two choices for the bullies that are in your life, those that the enemy is using to bring discouragement to you and to, and to try to bring you down and pull you down. Two options. Either they repent, because if they're attacking you and you're trusting in God, they're attacking God. And God's saying, I'll deal with them. Or they'll either repent of that evil and I will bring them into a place of peace and I'll bring them into a place where they're loving you and they're doing what they should do for you. Or they'll have to deal with me and that end will be horrible. Um, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 9, he says, I'll make those who are of the synagogue of Satan come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I've loved you. So, so the truth is, is that when we trust in God for those who have been trying to bring us discouragement, either they will have to fall down at our feet and fall down at the feet of Jesus and acknowledge that he has loved us, or there will come a point at which they would humbly come before us and ask our forgiveness for what's been done. Um, I'll finish with just saying this, that, um, that the Kevin in the story, um, who is the bully, um, the most beautiful thing happened in that story. And that was that Kevin ended up um, coming to a relationship with Jesus. And in a relationship with Jesus, he actually became one of my closest friends. He was an accountability partner for me for, for 30 years. And uh, so this bully who was going to beat me up and have me weak at the knees, um, God did a work in his life of restoring him and and, and actually made one of the most powerful ministers of the gospel that you've ever known uh, out of Kevin. And he became one of the dearest friends that I have. Truth is, is that I've had other bullies that have never cared to repent, right? And you and I both have, and they'll have to deal with God. But our hope and desire is that they would. So right now, Lord, we just ask this 
of, um, of you for all of us because so many people, um, Lord, listening, have been in that place that um, they've been told by the enemy that nobody likes them and nobody cares. They've been told that they've messed everything up, including um, their relationship with you, that they've been told that even when they tried to do right, it was wrong. They've been told that they're helpless and weak and pitiful and laughable. They've been told that nobody should trust them. They've been told that everybody would be better without them. But Lord God, the, the Rabshakeh's in our lives, Lord God, we thank you that you teach us today that as we humble ourselves before you, that you lift us up and, and the voice of the Rabshakeh's, the, the voice of the enemy, the voice even when it's our own voice is stilled and we get to hear your voice and hear what you say about us and what you say about those who would oppose us. And Lord God, you move. And if that movement is to put to death 185,000 or if it's to bring somebody out of darkness into light that they would love and honor and glorify you, whatever the case may be, Lord God, you do good. And what we want to know is, is we want to know what you say about our rapture case. We want to know what you say about us. And we pray that out of that, we like Hezekiah would be encouraged in Jesus' name.